start with food first we do some testing so that once even after a month for for many of my patients a month of just changing the diet people have more energy they are sleeping better they are th clearer thinking less brain fog their mood is lighter uh, they might they might be uh, less depressed. It, so everybody's different. I've, I mean, I had a patient recently come back and she said, not only did her depression go away, her social anxiety went away. Yeah. And she didn't even expect that because she had had social anxiety much longer. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman. And if you or your loved ones suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, stress, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health experts from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal over the long term. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. I just wanted to welcome you to this podcast for Mind Health 360, which is the podcast for integrative mental health and functional medicine psychiatry. A lot of people have are struggling, as you know, with mental health issues, depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor cognition. And a lot of the time, you know, they're given antidepressants, tranquilizers, sleeping pills. If they're lucky, they're prescribed some talk therapy. But right. when I went through my own sort of mental health crisis after my postpartum depression with both my, my boys, I found this thing called integrative mental health and functional medicine psychiatry, and it really changed my life. And I've always been surprised by how few people seem to know about this. And I think, you know, the the amount of people who know about it is growing. But what I really want to do is to, you know, really get the message out there that this type of psychiatry exists, that it's practiced by a few visionary psychiatrists such as yourself, and yeah. that it is life changing. And I'm so grateful to you for having written this amazing book, What If It's Not Depression? Because I, it, it's just the most most fantastic book. It's a sort of 101 <laughs> of integrative mental health and functional medicine psychiatry. And it really summarizes to me a, in a really succinct, easy to read way, you know, all the different aspects that impact your mental health. Dr. Chena Stein, and that you're an osteopathic physician, and you've been a board certified psychiatrist for over 25 years. But because you have your osteopathic roots, essentially, that's enabled you to really explore conventional medicine in it from a slightly different angle. And I think that's very important. And you're very interested in the biochemistry and the psychosocial treatment approach of mental health essentially and you know from your biog you basically also had a psychoanalytic track and you're well trained in psychodynamic psychotherapy as well as cbt and you've worked with a number of patients with trauma issues mood and dissociative disorders but you also have huge experience in using psychopharmacology you worked with prison populations community mental health centers and you know you've worked across a very wide board of patient geriatric psychiatry psychiatry and patient population. And I think you became quite frustrated with the limitations of, you know, pharmacological treatment of mental health issues. And I'm going to let you talk about what led you to your journey towards uh, functional medicine. And I understand it was your mother, your mother's health and your son's health and then your health as well. But I think it would be great to hear a little bit about that. And then also, I'd be very interested about, you know, what motivated you to write this book finally? And, you know, what, why do you think this information needs to get out there? And I will shut up and let you speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think what led me to actually dive into functional medicine was my journey with my son. And, you know, it's interesting that as a psychiatrist, you know, you see patients and you're trained to do psychotherapy, or at least I was. Um, nowadays, it's not happening as much anymore, unfortunately. But I, you know, did my due diligence in getting as much history as possible and making sure I arrived at a diagnosis so I can, you know, prescribe the right medications. And, and, and when 
someone really close to you becomes very, very ill in the same way. And, you know, you go like my son. I mean, my son basically overnight became uh, markedly depressed and suicidal, standing on a fifth floor ready to jump basically out the window. And that's that was my introduction to my son being very, very ill. And, and how you know, old was I, he? He was in puberty, so I would say 14. Okay. So, yes, he was 14. Super strange. And yeah, uh, it was it was overnight, and it 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 was just shocking <laughs> when that something like that happens, and you're the psychiatrist, <laughs> and and so we were in France actually at the time, and so but when we got home, it was a few weeks later that we got home, and and I had him see a psychiatrist and had had him put on medications and and it was he was on three medications and although he wasn't suicidal and he was a little less depressed he was still extremely anxious not sleeping at night and the big clincher for me was that he couldn't read anymore and that it was that symptom that made me think there's got to be something else going on here and it, this is not just depression there's something else going on here and part of me felt like I have to abandon what I've been trained to do because I can't live with my son being on three medications. And I kind of felt like a hypocrite at that moment. It was a crisis for me too, because it's like my son's on three medications and he's still miserable. He's not suicidal, but he's miserable. And I have to find something else. I have to. Okay. Uh, and so it was, but it was that particular symptom that he couldn't read anymore. I think if that symptom wasn't present, I almost wonder sometimes, you know, would I have gone down that road? Would I have really searched, you know? And it, but it, it was because of that symptom that made me think there's something else going on here. So it was, but it, what's interesting is I didn't, I didn't actually search immediately at that point because in a parallel level, I was actually searching for other patients. It was actually because of other patients also that I was hitting a roadblock every single, you know, at some point, not every single time, but at some point I was hitting a roadblock, like there's something else going on here. And I serendipitously just happened to, it's just so interesting how life happens for paths cross and I happen to be looking for other alternative ways to treat my patients because I felt like I was missing something. There's something I don't know that I just knew. And, and so I just happened to then find a functional medicine doctor who I asked to shadow, not to see my son, to, but I asked to shadow so I can learn more about what he was doing. And after a while, I realized, oh my gosh, I have to bring my son here. And so that's, that is when I started to see amazing results and just even with him. And then I, I have to do this. I ha I, how can you turn back? Absolutely. Once you see the power of functional medicine, you can't turn back. And I find that most functional ma medicine practitioners, they go down that path because of their own health or because of someone close to them that has transformed as a result of functional medicine. And it's not for everybody. Uh, you know, it, 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 as you probably know, it takes work, you know, but it, the yeah. results are lifelong. And, and, and it's not just taking one symptom away with, by suppressing them. It's really your whole life is transformed as a result of it. Completely. And I completely agree. And that's certainly what happened to me and, you know, countless other people. But you're right. I mean, it takes work. It takes more time. It takes more money. It takes more effort. Um, mm -hmm. It's not taking one simple pill. And I think the reason for that is because it is so kind of 360 degrees, you know, it's a full circle that you have to approach all the angles of your mental health. And so how, you know, one of the things I'm interested in asking people is how, what's their understanding of what integrative mental health means? Or, you know, what are the key components that they would say define integrative mental health, you know, if you compare it to sort of mainstream psychology? Psychiatry. My idea about integrative health is, I think, very different from other people's because I think most people believe that integrative is having aspects of their other treatments added 
into what they're doing. For example, acupuncture or chiropractor or or massage or, you know, so things added to their current treatment. And I don't consider, I used to think that functional medicine was integrative, but it's, it's really more, I think, holistic because we're actually getting down to the nitty gritty in the root cause. And that might in, include treatments that might be acupuncture or other things, but, but there's a reason why you're including certain certain treatments it's to affect a, a specific change that's been determined in advance um, and so it is important to really get down to putting a person's history on a timeline and figuring out all the different mechanisms so I, I, I like to use the word layers but uh, one of my patients said you know drivers make more sense to me the word drivers <laughs> make more sense to me the mechanism like what are the mechanisms that are creating inflammation which then as a result lead to a manifestation of symptoms like depression and so depression is just a symptom that's expressed as a result of things that are happening in the body physiologically but when it comes to depression there's other layers like the social aspects you know the toxic environment they're a toxic environment emotionally as well as physically you know and then there's the internal toxic environment emotionally so there's it when it comes to mental health issues there's there's layers on uh, on a number of levels that people you know need to look at not just what we traditionally know as emotional versus uh, I mean I don't even know what to call psychiatry anymore to be <laughs> honest because you know as you've read in my book you know it, it, a diagnosis is really determined based on symptoms and not by cause and it's truly it, a, a diagnosis is is uh, determined solely for the purpose of trying to match a medication for for a diagnosis or you know th the purposes of billing insurance or to do research i mean and those are important reasons if that's your if that's what you want right but it doesn't speak to root causes and you and, and so from my perspective a diagnosis is not really necessary because we're looking at everything that's happening in the body and mental health symptoms are just a part of it, you know. Completely. And I think that's that's what comes across really well in your book, I think. And I love the mm -hmm. title of your book, you know, What If It's Not Depression? Because, I mean, people just think, oh, depression is this kind of label, you know. And obviously, you know, right. the DSM-5 has, you know, hundreds of labels. But I, I really right. like that, that, in fact, depression is a symptom that there's right. something wrong rather than a disorder. And I think that's exactly. a, that's a really important yeah. point that comes across in your book. It's a symptom rather than a disorder. And then right. your job as the detective who's practicing functional medicine is to find the root cause of that symptom. And I think that's a really important distinction because, you know, right. mainstream psychiatry treats it as the disorder itself. Right. As opposed to the yeah. symptom of something. You know, and let's take it let's take it a step further. Depression is a physical symptom. Completely. Right? Yeah, like a, <laughs> right? right? In the same way that pain, physical pain, is an emotional symptom. Yeah, completely. And I think that's a really important point. I mean, it's a physical symptom. And so I love what you what you you came up with this brilliant acronym, the SHIFT acronym. I think that's yours. I think that's, uh, you came up with that, right? I mean, I'd never seen well, that before. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's what's funny is that i i don't know i mean i'm sure i've read things that come together and people have talked about paradigm shift paradigm shift makes a lot of sense uh i i don't know if that's ac actually my uh acronym but i but at the same time i couldn't tell you who said that but there's so many people that say a lot of the same things and and find acronyms to you know to try to remember those things so i mean i and i've played around with different acronyms like fist you know so foods infections uh foods infections stress and toxins you know but shift shift seem to just work really well and it's what i use in my practice so there are things that i say in my practice 
on a daily basis that I, that's why, I mean, it was, that's my book is basically what I say to my patients pretty regularly. And I had a patient who said to me, it's like, when I was reading your book, I could hear your voice <laughs> just well, telling me exactly it, what It's true. I mean, your book is very personal and it's really, it's, you know, that's the beauty of it. It's, it's, and, and the other thing I love about your book is it's just, it's such a great self-help book. I mean, it really gives you a roadmap, you know, if you have depression or any of these other mental health symptoms, anxiety, insomnia, etc. These, you know, it's a very clear step-by-step -step guide and it gives you tremendous number of resources, you know, tests and apps and all sorts mm -hmm. of, you know, very clear tables that you can fill in and exercises that you can do to really almost self-diagnose and self-help. And I mean, right. I, you know, obviously I know that one should always work with a health practitioner, but I think for anybody suffering from any sort of common mental health disorders or their friends, their families, this book is a really clear guide on, you know, what steps to take to help yourself. And I think one of the things also that comes across is this sort of personalized medicine that, you know, it's not a one size fits all, that you really have to go through and figure out what your particular symptoms, what your lifestyle, you know, what your biochemistry is to then be able to, you know, find a solution that's custom fit to you. Right. And, you know, so talking about your voice, I mean, that, you know, it's almost as if you're getting your own consultation with you. And I think that's tremendously powerful. But just to go back to the SHIFT acronym, so do you want to tell us, tell us what SHIFT is? Because what I love about, um, so, you know, what my understanding is that the SHIFT acronym is, you know, these are the key things that can impact your mental health, you know, and there are five of them and they're in the SHIFT acronym. So if you right. talk us through that, I, I mean, I love it. Sure, sure. So shift, it's basically five pillars. It's sort of the, the, the scope that I use in terms of when people are giving me their history. I look through these five layers as to how it fits. So the S is for stress. H is for hormones, I is for infections, foods, F is for foods, and T is for toxins. And so, you know, what's interesting is that my, um, my editor actually wanted me to change the acronym because even though it's shift, uh, we start with foods <laughs> because we start in the middle because foods really has the greatest impact changing your diet. And that's where I start with my patients. Changing your diet is you can have the most impact very, very, very quickly. And a lot of people don't realize how much food is poison and how much food is medicine. And it's finding those foods that are right for you. And there's a bazillion diets out there, but, you know, to start with, it's, you know, starting with an anti-inflammatory diet, removing those foods that are causing inflammation and processed foods is, and sugar are at the top <laughs> and, and then with gluten and, uh, and dairy, but, but then, you know, adding those foods that uh, can heal and help the body heal are, is, and is, you know, basically the very first step. And so then I go, I do testing, um, to find any kind of chronic infections that might be happening in the body that, uh, and the only way to do that is to do a stool test or, and an organic acid test. So I, those are my top two tests and, uh, along with some blood work and, it, because there's, it's really going to be hard to figure that out without actually doing those tests. I mean, we can figure out some things based on history, but to really figure it out, the testing is really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you know what you're treating and, and why. And then we have uh, stress. That's the S. Um, and hormones are part of the stress because of cortisol. So cortisol is a major hormone that becomes elevated in times of acute and chronic stress. The other hormones are thyroid, and, you know, cortisol is an adrenal hormone, but then there's thyroid hormones and all the sex hormones. So we look at those. I tend not to treat the sex hormones until after we've done the other areas of the shift, because a lot of times if you can bring the stress hormones down, then the thyroid kicks back into place. Sometimes when the body's under a great deal of stress and you have cortisol going up, the thyroid kicks in to down regulate in order to bring the body back into 
balance. So I sometimes find that people are saying, oh, I have hypothyroidism, but let's put it into the context of what's really happening into the body. Uh, because if you just narrow in sometimes on the thyroid, unless it's really out of control, obviously you want to take a look at that and, and possibly treat it. But if it's just a little off, sometimes it's a matter of looking at, well, why is the body deciding to do that? Think about why is the body down-regulating? What's going on in the body that it needs to do that in order to keep the body in homeostasis? Because if you just treated those numbers, then you're actually taking away something in the body that might be helping. <laughs> so I look for what's stressing the body, what's causing inflammation, what's emotionally stressing in the body, and try to affect the change in those areas before I actually, boom, treat the thyroid. So it doesn't mean to say I don't, but it's, again, putting things in context to the situation. And so we have S H I F, um, and the T is toxins. And so emotional toxins and uh, toxins around your world, in your world that you're breathing in, putting on your body and eating. (laughs) So completely. And that's what I love about this is just, you know, the fact that those five things are absolutely crucial. And the other thing, you know, more and more now we're talking about the fact that depression and anxiety and, you know, mental health issues, even neurodegenerative uh, diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are the result of inflammation. So they're also inflammatory diseases. And it's, you know, uh, we've always, I mean, the big breakthrough was that diabetes and cancer and heart disease were inflammatory diseases. And now it's, well, actually mental health diseases are also inflammatory diseases. And what I like about this SHIFT acronym is that, you know, these are all factors which cause inflammation. So stress, you know, hormonal imbalances, infections, the wrong foods and toxins will all create an inflammatory environment, which will then can cause neuroinflammation, can then lead to mental health symptoms. And so whilst now it's getting into the mainstream that well, actually, yeah, depression can be seen as an inflammatory disease, you know, there's still a missing link as to, okay, but what is causing that inflammation? And I think your SHIFT acronym you know, obviously it's very complex uh, when right. you drill down into it, but it's sort of the perfect storm between all those factors that then creates a sort of inflammatory environment and inflammation. And I think one of the, the chapters in your book is about gut. And obviously, you know, gut cuts across this whole shift thing. I keep coming back to that, but I mean, gut would be under food. Certain foods can irritate the gut and cause gut dysbiosis or you know, toxins can can cause leaky gut or stress can cause leaky gut, etc. So, you know, I think the, the the gut is one of the key parts underlying this whole inflammatory process. And I don't know if yeah. you want to talk about that. I mean, again, in Absolutely. mainstream, we're talking a lot about gut as the second brain. But if you can right. explain a little bit, because I know it's a big ch- part of your book. Yeah, actually, you know, when 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 we have some really complicated, sometimes we have some practitioners who like, where do I start? You have all these problems, you know, and it, it, the place to start would be the gut. If all else fails, you don't know where to start, you start with the gut. And so, and it's the 5R approach, which, you know, you learn from the Institute of, uh, for Functional Medicine, which is where I was certified, uh, is removing, replacing, re-inoculating, repairing, and then rebalancing. And so I it, the gut is definitely the highway. Um, I, I like to use, I don't know, I think I wrote this in the book where it's sort of going through customs. Yes. <laughs> you know, when food passes through the gut, it's like going through customs and it's trying to figure out, you know, what stay, what can be invited into the, the body through the gut lining. And it is having those customs people to make sure. So your immune system is basically having those officers there checking out whether or not you belong here or you don't belong here. And if there's a increased gut permeability or also known as leaky gut, it's as if those customs people are not present and just anybody's allowed to come through. And so that's what creates havoc is, you know, parts of parts of the outside come into the body through the gut lining. So if we can change what's happening at that lining and manage it better by supporting the immune system, a lot of times that can get better. I have one patient who 
um, has had severe depression and, and she has uh, anorexia nervosa. And everyone she sees assumes that everything that's going on with her is due to her anorexia. And believe it or not, um, she has had anorexia for a number of years, but what's also there is her uh, inability to digest and absorb B12, absorb iron, folate, because she has small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so when that is something that's in, it's in the gut, it's a gut infection that's basically in the small intestine. And there are so many reasons why that could be there. It could be because of the anorexia and the stress that she's been under that created the anorexia. But then it's looking at, well, what is happening in the gut? So, so it's also even looking at the root causes of the root causes. Like why is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, there in the first place. So, and because it will, if you even if you treat it, it will come back unless you even address those root causes. So it is digging even deeper. But her depression is multi layered. It's not even just I have a physiological change in my body because of this gut infection. It's also because I'm not feeding myself the foods that are healthy, and I have a lot of stress not because of my past that created the anorexia, but also because I'm being invalidated. I'm not being heard and nobody's helping me. And I'm I'm made to feel like I'm a hypochondriac and that the only problem I have is anorexia and all I have to do is eat more. Right. And this is, (laughs) I think this is the challenge. And I think this is also the beauty of functional medicine is that, you know, it's both the the beautiful thing about it is that you do treat the whole person and all the causes and then you can actually get someone well so you can actually sustainably heal that person but the challenge is there are so many causes and there's so many chicken and egg you know what comes first i mean i find anorexia fascinating because you know there are a lot of rehabs around the world that deal with it as an addictive behavior so it's an addictive behavior which makes it purely sort of psychological but then if you actually you look at the biochemistry behind it and you know for instance that people with anorexia tend to have low serotonin and low serotonin and they found a, a correlation in fact between veganism or vegetarianism and eating disorders so things like bulimia and anorexia and the theory was that you know a, a lot of young girls who suffer from anorexia and bulimia or who've chosen to become vegetarian or vegan for moral reasons then right. are not getting enough proteins which are the precursors the building blocks to uh, exactly. the neurotransmitters such as serotonin. And, you know, so, so, and then you talked about the B12 and all the other, you know, the absorption. And issues. iron. And iron. iron. <laughs> exactly. And so, right. you know, the complexity is you have to look at all this and say, yeah, of course, it's not just because you're not eating. It's or because right. you're, you've got some sort of addictive behavior, some issue with your father. It's also the biochemistry, you know, possibly... Uh, low beta endorphins and low serotonin, etc., which is causing body dysmorphia. So that's what, exactly. what is so interesting, in fact, about functional medicine is that you take all these factors into account, but it also makes it quite challenging. Do you find challenges in trying to get people to comply with treatments which can be quite lifestyle orientated and quite complicated, and also which might cost more money and much, might take more time and effort do you as a as a integrative doctor sometimes think okay well you know it would be easier to prescribe a pill because sometimes you know i do talk to either doctors or patients who said yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i I get that this is a much better long-term solution but just give me a pill it's so much easier i mean right well in in my practice we have a screening process we give a free consultation by the phone and it's some of the questions that we ask are about those very things because we only let people who are ready uh, to do the work and understand what kind of practice we have. And so we tend to get people who are really frustrated with the current system, really want to do other things than be taking medication for the rest of their life and are willing to do the work. And because we don't want to take your money unless 
you know, we're going to make sure you have results. <laughs> so the results aren't with just us doing the work. You also have to do the work and have to be willing to do the work and understand that it is work, but also understand what the end game is. And the results are lifelong. And it's not just your, your mental health symptoms are improved. Your whole life is improved. People feel younger. People feel more vibrant. Their brain is sharper and sometimes 10 to 15 years younger. I mean, people, I, I know that for myself. I mean, I feel 15 years younger. You know, I was very sick when I was in my early, uh, I guess, mid thirties, you know, mid thirties in, into uh, early forties. And so, and I'm 56 years old. You look so, amazing. Oh my God, you're so, 56. You look amazing. You're like the best walking advertisement for this type of medicine. You're amazing. <laughs> you look gorgeous. Functional medicine. Wow. <laughs> No, but really, I mean, I, I play ultimate Frisbee. I'm on a, you know, on, I, I, I am extremely active and I feel 15 years younger. And it's, and it's because of the lifestyle changes that I made. You know, I have Hashimoto's. I, I, I almost can say that I probably don't have Hashimoto's because my, I, my antibodies are almost gone. Uh -huh. And, you know, there's, they're not even registering really uh, above abnormal, but I still have to take some thyroid medication because part of my thyroid's burned out. And I think if I knew 15, 20 years ago, what to do, what I know now, I probably wouldn't be on thyroid medication. Who knows? Who knows? But it would have been nice for me to know that. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so it's, uh, <clears throat> and I think, I mean, that's what you, and, and what you mentioned, people who come into your practice and, you know, you do have a practice. Where, what is it called and where is it based? My private practice is Functional Mind yeah. and it is in East Providence, Rhode Island, and that's near Boston. Yeah. And we're about an hour, hour and a half out of Boston. I did start an online health coaching program to help people as a companion program for my book to help people navigate through it. Because a lot of times it's, even though you can read a book and as you said, they are steps that you can take that it's uh, pretty easy to follow. But if you don't have the motivation to do it, which depression can, can certainly cause you to have low motivation and you don't know the order in which to do it for yourself, it is helpful to have someone to work with. And so I did start an online health coaching program where it's not a doctor patient relationship, but it's a coach client relationship, but they're getting the doctor's knowledge in that. And it's a lot more contact on a weekly basis. And so if people are interested in, you know, working with me in that capacity from anywhere, I, I, they can contact me at achinasteindo.com. I have a website, achinasteindo.com, and they can schedule a free consultation with me to get into that program. I mean, that sounds They're amazing because I think one of the challenges is, and one of the things I like about functional medicine is that you're really a team with your doctor. So you, you become a sort of co-detective in this route to try to uncover the root causes. And it's really helpful to have someone in that team and to have somebody like you, who's also a qualified psychiatrist, et cetera, and, you know, has all these amazing qualifications as a functional medicine doctor as well, I think is a huge bonus. And it's particularly interesting, I'm particularly interested because I run this website that promotes integrative mental health to give access to people around the world to this type of medicine. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not in the US, it's very hard to get access to this. I mean, I'm based in the UK and it's very difficult to get this type. It's starting to grow, but then there are other parts of the world where there's really nothing. And so I think that's hugely helpful. And, right. you know, uh, I, maybe I'll bring my son to see you. <laughs> my son <laughs> needs some help as well. The other question I have, you know, a lot of mainstream doctors will say, oh, well, you know, there's no evidence behind functional medicine. You know, this is all sort of new and there's not enough evidence. And I've heard that a surprisingly large um, amount. So, you know, even though functional medicine is practiced by absolutely, you know, board certified, distinguished members of the board, etc., all MDs and DOs, etc. 
there's still a lot of resistance in mainstream medicine to this on the basis, supposedly, that there is not enough evidence behind it. And yet, from, certainly from my research, I don't think that's the case. But how do you counter that sort of argument and reassure people that actually this is something that's here to stay, that works, and that does have the evidence? You know, uh, what would you say to that? Well, just because there's you no... Know, evidence doesn't mean that something doesn't work. <laughs> so true. there are sometimes studies aren't done because there's no profit. <laughs> so there is there is evidence of repeated use over time. And so case reports, if people write case reports, and if you add up all those case reports, then that is mounting evidence, and it's and then it's a matter of actually forming a study that somebody's willing to pay in order to determine if something is working. But that tends to be really random. What people are looking for are random, oh, sorry, double-blind placebo-controlled trials. But that is really for one treatment, like a pill, right? <laughs> right? And so I think what we need is a different way of 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 showing that the functional medicine approach works and there are studies being done and it's using things like the multiple symptom questionnaire and i, I think that's uh, you're probably familiar with that yeah. where you have a score at the time like that i use at the time of my intake and then i follow that score to determine whether or not someone is getting better and it, and it shows the patient as well every month when i see someone I have them fill out that form and that number drops down. The goal is to have it drop down to 10. So it's not necessarily showing that one thing has caused that uh, score to drop, one intervention, but multiple interventions are causing that score to drop. And you know, I believe the Cleveland Clinic is doing studies using me those, that method and there are there are definitely some functional medicine practitioners that are now uh, publishing papers and articles in terms of specific interventions but I, I think it's a matter of looking at there are a number of interventions that are causing overall this number to come down <laughs> and that's really the goal honestly is to get someone better and so if we can show through screening that a particular intervention caused not particular a, a number of interventions together cause someone to improve that would be great right Completely, so yeah. uh, you know what i find interesting is that you know from in the physical world right that people are looking for, you know, prove that this one thing worked, that, 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 you know, everyone jumps on that bandwagon. But if you look in the mental health world, there are so many different types of psychotherapies. You know, uh, no one says, oh, this psychotherapy is better and then that psychotherapy and this one's more superior than that psychotherapy. People understand intuitively that psychotherapy is based on the person's psychological makeup and their specific issues at the time and so i might you know i might use cognitive behavioral therapy to to sort of manage a person's emotional ability so that they can get control over how they interact with the world but once they're able to master that which is basically improving the defense mechanism of intellectualization right you're putting your wise mind in, in balancing your emotional reactivity once you master that then you can get to the root cause about well why were you even that way in the first place yeah. <laughs> right using psychodynamic psychotherapy and your inter your relationships with people growing up so that way you can then understand how your relationships in your present life are being affected by how you interpret your relations from your past. And that doesn't mean you have to open up your whole past. You can just use the clues of your present life to understand, you know, how you interact, how, what you, how you dance with people in your current life and dance with your environment in your current life to figure out where, why that is by looking, by examining how, 
So how that, you know, connects back to right. specific things that happened in your past life. So, you know, we do that in the psychotherapy, psychological world. Why can't we do that in the physical world? Completely. <laughs> right? What's interesting about functional medicine is that it's really a number of different factors. And so it's not like you can do one randomized control trial, double blind, that will then point to that silver bullet, you know, that will fix you because that's not how it works. And so I think that's part of the complexity is that, you know, what works is a whole combination of factors which are tailored for a combination of causes, essentially, or contributors. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's easy to just throw that out. It's a simple way to shut down the conversation on their end Yeah. because I think it can be very threatening to explore something outside of what you've been told over again and again and again, yeah. you know, in your training. And it, it can be frightening. Like, how could I not know this if this is not valid? Completely. Um, I, I mean, I just remember how it took a lot of courage to step outside of what I knew, <laughs> you know, what I thought, well, this is the truth. <laughs> this is the way I do things. And it takes a lot of courage to, to do that. And, and I think it does take an emotional experience with someone you love or with your own health, you know, in order for you to step out of that and explore, because then you're desperate. Like, you know, I mean, somebody's told me if you, I mean, if your son was kidnapped and, you know, you had to get a million dollars to get him back, you would do anything, You'd do right? Anything. Exactly. <laughs> you would do anything. 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 I know. <laughs> right? But I mean, thank God for all these health crises that, that everyone has had, because that's what's advancing, what what's moving the needle. And I mean, my theory is that in the next 10 years, I think it will become so much more mainstream. I mean, I think this stands to reason. There's no way that it can't because it is the one thing that works. And you've seen this in your own practice, that that questionnaire number is coming down and right. that you're getting people better. Do you want to just take us through very quickly, um, you know, if somebody comes in to see you with, say, depression or panic attacks mm -hmm. or something, like what would be your process and what would be the sort of top things that you would look for and how would you, how how long would it typically take to get that person better? And what are the steps that you would go through just for people, you know, because the people listening to this are often lay people who are just struggling with common mental health issues. They don't necessarily know what's entailed by integrative mental health or functional medicine psychiatry. So just from a practical perspective, you know, what would you do if somebody came to you and said, okay, well, I've got massive panic attacks and depression. Where would you start? I know you explained this in the book really well. So right. I think people should read your book, but just sort of in a nutshell, Basically, I need to gather information. So the person who I'd be working with and I are basically Sherlock Holmes and Watson, right? Gathering all of the information from birth and, you know, pre-birth even sometimes it, based on what they put on, on uh, the intake. So I provide a 39-page intake. 39 and pages. That, yes, 39-page intake. Before you even see me, I review all of those all of that information and I start writing things on a timeline of from that intake onto a timeline and I try to find where all the layers are and how things interconnect looking for where the perfect storm is uh, occurred in their life that caused the balance to tip uh, where the immune system got tipped over and so sometimes people have more than one perfect storm and uh, it's uh, so I, I look for those layers and it helps me to know where to start or where to really zone in, not necessarily where to start, because I always start with food. And so I put that information on a timeline. And the purpose of doing that is to explain really for that person to know, boy, I've been sick for a long time. It's not just depression. It's all of these other things, too, that led to depression. Completely. And depression is a symptom, exactly. Exactly. So it's really more for them to see this has been going on for a lot longer than you really realize. And these are all the drivers that we need to address and why. So once a person understands what all of those drivers are and why, then they have more hope. 
and like, oh, I can do this. Yeah. Like I can really do this. And it gives them the the motivation to move forward, you know, and then as I said, you know, we start with food first. We do some testing so that once, even after a month, for, for many of my patients, a month of just changing the diet, people have more energy, they are sleeping better, they are th- clearer thinking, less brain fog, their mood is lighter, uh, they might they might be uh, less depressed. It, so everybody's different. I've, I mean, I had a patient recently come back and she said, not only did her depression go away, her social anxiety went away. Wow. And she didn't even expect that because she had had social anxiety much longer. And so people are always surprised, but sometimes some symptoms that they didn't expect to go away, go away. But then the depression might take three months or it might take six months. But at least it gives them hope because they see other things changing Right. Uh, first. So like for my son, uh, he had severe constipation since he was two years old. And he had severe, severe eczema since he was two years old. And those two things went away within a month. Wow. That's amazing. That, I mean, that we never expected those things are going. Now, I just thought that was just what he, that's who he is. That's just a part of his life. <laughs> you know, he'll always be constipated. He'll always have this eczema. They went away within a month. And the depression took about three to four months. His anxiety took about a year. Um, the double vision, I'm oh, sorry, but remember I was telling you how he could read? Yeah. That took, I think that took a year to two years. And it was because he had so much inflammation in his body that the cranial nerves of his eyes were inflamed. Wow. And that he already had vision problems and had to wear pretty thick glasses, but the, uh, in, which is probably why he was vulnerable to that. Mm. But that took much longer. That was really the last thing to, to go away. But it didn't go away. That's amazing. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, for example, taking your son as an example, I mean, you started with food and you fixed I, his diet completely. And then did you treat other things? Like, you know, did you do a sort of gut protocol where you uh, used herbs and absolutely. probiotics to yes. heal his gut? So, yeah. So food is removing, removing foods, removing toxins like alcohol, <laughs> you know, so people are, are still drinking alcohol or smoking. I mean, those things are going to be really important. I get very, I I don't think I've had a single smoker in my, come into my practice, you know, who want to do functional medicine, but there's a number of social drinkers and you do need to stop drinking alcohol for a good eight weeks in order for the gut lining to heal back. That doesn't mean to say it has to be forever, but you know, it, it is removing those toxins in order for you to then re re-inoculate the gut lining. And sometimes it's removing like the gut infections that might be taking herbal antimicrobials, depending on what shows up on the stool test. But then there is a following up with the gut healing protocol to repair the gut lining. So remove, replace all of the nutrients you know, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients to help the body work more efficiently and re-inoculating the gut microbiome with probiotics and then repairing the gut lining. And then ultimately you want to rebalance what caused the the imbalance in the first place, what caused the, the perfect storm right. uh, in the first place. So it's always going back to the beginning. And sometimes when I do the MSQ, so every every month that people come in, we do the MSQ, that's that score scoring that I do. If we plateau, at some point, if we go back to the drawing board, it's like, okay, we missed something. Because, you know, what you come up with in terms of how we're going to approach this is based on the history that you provide. And so sometimes when we go back to the beginning, it's like, oh, I forgot to tell you about the root canal that I had and I threw up into my mouth and it got infected. (laughs) You know, it's those kinds of things that people then realize that they didn't hadn't thought about in a long time so it's going back to the beginning sometimes and thinking okay something we're missing something here what do you know what happened around this 
this these years you know we go back to the timeline there's something happened here because we fixed this we fixed this we fixed this and there's still you something know? and it's extraordinary because people don't realize that things like you know an infected root canal can actually cause mental health problems later down the line i mean Absolutely. you know and that's what needs to get into the mainstream is that you know all these things whether they're mercury fillings in your teeth or whether right. it's an infected root canal or whether it's you mm -hmm. know maybe lyme disease or mold or so chronic chronic sinus infections that is a major root cause for depression i cannot tell you how many people live with chronic mucus production and blow, you know waking up in the middle of the night to blow your nose and daily constant you know runny nose or you know or and so what's the root cause of that is there an infection is it a histaminergic reaction but it's a it's a source of inflammation and look how close it's to the brain right Completely. <laughs> so, and then also yeah. you wonder whether you know if if people are then treated with antibiotics for those sinus infections does that then disturb the gut microbiome which then causes exactly. further inflammation you know so it's it's a really interesting piece of detective work that you have to do with your patient in order to get to the root cause but the beauty of this is that once you do that and you fix, as you were saying, you know, layer by layer, all these problems, you can actually get to a point where you're in better mental health and physical health is a lovely byproduct of that than you've right. ever been before. And you age backwards as well. So, I mean, there's just nothing you know negative to say about this functional medicine thing right except that it takes time it takes it does and it can take you know hard work on the part of both yeah. the doctor and the patient it can it can take time i mean uh, it can take as little as three months you know i i would say 50 percent of my patients it's as little as three months and then there it can take as long as a few years. So it's really dependent on what those layers are. And it seems to be that it's like things like Lyme's disease, if, if it's chronic, um, you know, chronic uh, issues re as a result of Lyme or other chronic viral infections, mold toxicity is, uh, you know, though it's, if the depression is related to those things, they tend to take longer. That doesn't mean it's not resolvable. They just tend to take longer. Take longer. And, you know, from a mental health standpoint, I find that no self-worth, a lack of self-worth or, you know, acute feelings of self-hatred, they tend to because, you know, if you're telling the body you're not worth getting well, then you're not going to get well. I completely, mean, completely. You know, so yeah. you have to change your mindset about that and you have to want to live. You have to want to be well. You have to believe that you deserve to be well. You have to believe that you can contribute to the society and be part of society and that you can and want to be happy. Completely. Those those are foundational thoughts and feelings that really prevent people from moving forward. And so I find, honestly, it's that, those, that piece right there that, that out, of, out of everything, <laughs> is, those are my patients that are seeing me for five years, you know, and they're incrementally getting better. So it's really those thoughts and feelings that actually can have to shift. They have to change. Completely. And that's what I find also really great. I mean, in your book, you talk a lot about the, you know, physiological, the biochemical, and then the psychosocial. And on my website, I talk about the three pillars, the biochemical, the psycho-spiritual, I call it, and then the lifestyle yeah. behavioral. And it's really about approaching all those things and, and fixing them. And whether it's trauma from your childhood, which then leads to chronic stress, which leads to chronic right. hormonal and HPA about, you know, imbalances. And, you, you know, all this thing needs to be looked at from sort of a 360 degree perspective. And if, yes. can you treat, would you say that functional medicine, I mean, is obviously some some uh, mental health issues may require drugs either temporarily or maybe mm -hmm. more permanently but would you say that functional medicine can really help with any type of mental health issues from bipolar to schizophrenia to neurodegenerative diseases to addiction issues etc or would you say that there are certain 
disorders, I don't like really calling them disorders, but certain mental health issues that Mm -hmm. are more prone to being helped by functional medicine than others? Uh, You know, just like dementia. I mean, dementia at some point is a neurodegenerative disease. Once there's certain damage done, uh, you know, there it reaches a point where it's not reversible, yeah. you know? So if you can catch it early, the earlier you catch it, the better. That being said, so schizophrenia, again, there's multiple, you know, even the literature shows pretty easily that there's multiple root causes, infectious and biochemical. There's all viral, you know, there's people talk about all of these possible root causes. There's tons of literature about what could potentially cause schizophrenia. And so it's a matter of, again, looking for those root causes and see what can be reversible. So I've seen schizophrenia caused by C. difficile infection because C. diff, for example, inhibits beta dopamine hydroxyl hydroxylase, which then increases um, dopamine. So that's what, if you find that kind of thing and you bring that back into balance, then, you know, remove that infection and, and reduce the, the cause of um, the increase in dopamine, then you can potentially remove the psychosis. So it's, so uh, it is a matter of looking, finding those things early. So I have treated schizophrenia but within two years, um, pretty successfully, many people are diagnosed bipolar disorder, misdiagnosed, I should say, yeah. bipolar disorder. But a, even a true uh, bipolar disorder, again, it's looking for those multiple root causes. They can be, it can be resolved. If someone has been on an antidepressant and has for two decades, multiple antidepressants for two decades, had had ECT, TMS, you know, the, it is looking at, again, all the possible root causes. So let's say it's somebody who has had those issues and they eat processed food and they have a lot of sugar, the likelihood of a change occurring by changing their diet uh, and improving is a lot higher than someone who is already eating a really healthy diet. But if they haven't searched for the other possibilities, I think there's always room for improvement is, is what I'm trying to say. Completely. You know, it's complicated. It's, it's complicated. There's always room for impro- improvement. And until you really sit down with that person and look at all the variables, then um, I don't think you can say that it's not possible. Completely. Anything's possible Completely. anything's possible and even you know just even people who are on you know antidepressants for instance i mean they have shown that right. practicing sort of a functional medicine approach will improve absolutely. the outcomes you know absolutely uh, you know i you know i uh, funnily enough when i was actually um medical director for a community mental health center here locally i actually had a patient who, uh, and this was before I even became a functional medicine doctor, and he had had schizophrenia for five years, and he chose to change his diet. And he basically was on three medications. And within a year of changing his diet and exercise, he chose to do all of these. He completely transformed his his uh, body and he was able to come off of all of his medications and he tr- and he just left treatment and we checked up on him like six months later and he was doing fine without any medications and so you know it's what it's like that experience along with these you know there's always going to be that person who takes their health in their health care their and, and their um you know how how they interact uh, with the world into their own hands uh, and make these changes. And so uh, unfortunately it isn't something that we on a conventional level dole out on a regular basis saying, you know, your, your diet is extremely important. Most conventional doctors say, Oh, your diet has nothing to do with it. And that's so not true. True. (laughs) So not true. true. You know, so, you know, health, changing your diet is a major major way to uh, improve your health yep. not just your physical health but your mental, mental health. health major completely and i major. think you know so it, 
Yeah, I was just going to, that brings me on to my point where I wanted to ask you, you know, for our listeners, what would be your top five recommendations if you want to have optimal mental health or if you're suffering from some sort of, you know, depression or anxiety or insomnia or things, what would be your top five recommendations, you know, and I know it's slightly glib, but I think people like sort of nutshells. (laughs) Yeah. Well, okay, aside from changing your diet, removing sugar and and processed foods from your diet, you know, magnesium, most people are very deficient in magnesium. So taking a magnesium supplement, the only group of people who shouldn't take a magnesium supplement is somebody who has any kind of kidney issues. Uh, But that uh, is very helpful. The top two supplements that I give are magnesium and zinc, and they help with your sleep. Uh, magnesium in particular helps with sleep, mood, anxiety, cognition, muscle aches, constipation. Magnesium is amazing for supplement. So, and it's important to know that there are different kinds of magnesium. So I usually get different types of magnesium combined into one, one kind of capsule. Magnesium glycinate, taurate, citrate, malate. Those are all the, the most common types of the magnesium. So diet, (laughs) magnesium, getting, so getting yourself to sleep on a regular basis on, on a trying to, at least doing some form of movement. doesn't have to be exercise, you know, and somehow incorporating it into your daily, into your daily habits. Uh, If you go to the office, you know, instead of parking at the closest parking spot, park it at the farthest farthest parking spot take the stairs, you know, have a stand up desk like I'm in front of right now. <laughs> Very cool. You know, there are there are lots of things that you can do to incorporate movement in your in your daily life. So when you're pumping gas into your car, you know, doing, you know, leg side leg movements or if you're standing in line in in the uh in the grocery store with your cart doing some abdominal tucks, you know? (laughs) So uh, there's, there's so many things that you can do. And and it's a matter of thinking about uh, thinking out of the box about how can you do little things throughout the day and same thing with stress reduction, you know, so taking, you know, taking breaks every hour, having your phone, you know, send a, a, a nice, a friendly alarm <laughs> that can say, oh, it's time to get up and walk, walk out into the hall, you know, stretching your legs and coming back. Or I have sometimes patients in their, in their office building, take a break and go down the steps, go down the hall and the floor below them and go up the steps and come up, you know, and then, or just go outside and put your, you know, face the sun and get some sunshine, you know, taking those kinds of breaks and connecting with who you are, getting out of your head. And you can do that in five minutes. So So when people say I don't have time, you do have time. It's a matter of investing that time, finding the time, not, not, you know, you have to find and make the time and, and not, you know, waste it necessarily surfing on the phone and surfing on the internet and deleting emails. <laughs> you know? Emails, the bait of our existence. They, if they really think about how much time they spend on, on things that are, are, you know, really not important, they can delete that and create time where it can be helpful for them. So, so we talked about foods, <laughs> you know, foods, stress, and looking at what are what are you putting in what are you breathing in what are you putting into your body or on your body that you can eliminate that can that's actually causing your immune system to do one more thing you know Completely. so if there's toxins in that lotion or if there is air fresheners puffing out the synthetic air fresh you know synthetic Which they thing have in, in all the therapy. hospitals by the way <laughs> I know. Oh my God. I always feel so yeah. sorry for all these doctors who are working in these constant, you know, they're constantly pumping out air freshener in these hospitals. And I think, how can they get away with that? <laughs> I know it's, it's amazing. So your body, every time it inhales that has to remove it mm, completely <laughs> because it's synthetic. It's yeah. just one more thing that your body has to 
to deal with. And so thinking about those things. So foods, infections, toxins, stress. <laughs> those five things. I don't know. That's fantastic. Well, that's super helpful. And I will just make one more point, and then I'll let you go because you've been so generous with your time. <laughs> but one of the other things I loved about the book was that you were talking about the rhythms and how people have gotten out of rhythm, you know, the sort of natural rhythms, the circadian right. rhythms, the rhythms of connection, and that we're so obsessed with our technology and our phones that we're our, our rhythms, our biorhythms essentially are disrupted. And I think this is a huge right. problem. And I've done a, a few things on tech addiction because I, I see, you know, the younger generation, I mean, they're just glued to their phones all the time, which creates a disruption of the rhythms, as you say, and also sort of EMFs, you know, electromagnetic frequency and radiation. And I right. love that, what, what you said about that. I thought that was really right. beautiful. Yeah. And it's really, it's sad because the technology also isolates you from connecting with people. I see so many families sitting in a restaurant and, you know, the adults are talking, but the children are glued to their tablets or their phones. And it's just like, I find that to be really, really sad. And yeah, yes, you probably want your child to be behave in, in, in the restaurant, but you, there are other ways of making that by connecting to your Definitely, child. Right? So that I mean, one of the things that we them. did as we were raising, I have three adult children now, and as we were raising them, we played cards, mm. you know, uh, we, and it didn't matter if it was a fancy restaurant, if it, people would like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> you know, we didn't care because we're engaging our, I think it's important to engage with your child in a way that they want to engage with you and connecting with on, on, on some level. And so, Bring a deck of cards, okay. you know, and play cards. <laughs> you don't know how a, to play cards. That's Learn good. how to play yeah. cards, even if it's go fish. I don't know if you're familiar with yep, that. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I tried so desperately to get my sons to play cards with me and they refused, but I'm going to try again. <laughs> <laughs> you are match, matching cards. I mean, there's so many, there's other games. I mean, it's just, you know, Uno is, is a great card game. You know, it's just finding ways to connect with your child and, and be part of their of their life and you know i mean i think using a tablet or ipad once in a while or iphone whatever um you know some kind of smartphone in certain instances is absolutely necessary you know where where you you're in a doctor's office and you you know you need your child to sit in one place you know there's it certainly comes in handy but um i think it's important to try to find other ways there's so many other ways and okay. to explore those ways yeah you know? absolutely well thank you so much dr sheena stein and your book <laughs> what if it's not depression so how it's on amazon it's on it's available in the uk or in the u.s i mean i know it's in the u.s but what, what, tell yes, us about the it's timing. definitely available in the uk as well okay. um you can just uh go to amazon and t type my name or the title in um if you want i can send you the link for download in the uk you could also go to my website uh, achina stein do and download a pdf copy for free brilliant um, and so if that's what your viewers would like to do they're welcome to do that and that's um, amazing and so you're giving your book away for free oh absolutely that's yeah. amazing but yeah, because you absolutely. care so passionately about getting this information out there yes i that's really really important to me just to know for people to know that there is another way yeah and um and uh yeah i had a, a woman actually called my office um uh, last week from New Jersey saying that she got my book on Kindle and read it in a day and was so thrilled to, to read it and uh, it gave her hope you know so she it was then that made me that made my heart sore well, completely. <laughs> I mean it, look it's a brilliant book it's an absolutely wonderful book and it's such a gift that you're giving that for free to everybody you know because it really summarizes to me integrative mental health and how you can you know sort of 101 how you can really self-help your way and also work with a coach or a doctor right. to really mm -hmm. sustainably heal your mental health symptoms and you know it's a real gift to the world so i can't thank you thank enough and i'm sure there'll be you know millions of very very grateful people out there so thank you for leading the way oh thank you thank you for asking me to be interviewed i was it was such a pleasure 
talking to you and uh, I, I hope more people benefit from it. And if they're interested in working with me, they can. Uh, from an online uh, uh, perspective as well. so That's such that a great cool. treat. I'm going to be the first one. I'm going to get my son to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to work with you with my son. Um, but that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that your mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you may take to start your healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful. And if you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or check us out on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program. Thank you.